You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the network. Hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving Day, Black Friday, whatever the heck you celebrate out there here in the U.S. If you're all of our international listeners, hope you just had a great end of the week. <laughs> it seems like the markets conspire against us whenever we are on hiatus. That's when they decide to move with gusto. So we have a lot to break down here. Of course, my name, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever scintillating network. Please to see so many of you folks Jumping on board over the weekend there as well. Welcome to all of you newcomers. You know where to go if you want to learn more. Theoptionsslider.com slash secret club. Don't tell anybody. It's a secret. (laughs) And of course, if you're listening after the fact, like many of you do, keep rating and reviewing. It does help all these legion of new people who see a day like Friday. And they're like, what the heck? Where can I turn to learn more to discuss volatility? All this fun stuff helps them beat a path to our door. Of course, send in your own questions as well. We do love to hear from all of you folks out there. And before we hear who we're hearing from today, <laughs> let's hear from the decade that was the 80s. By the way, have you seen that new movie, 8-Bit Christmas, where they're fighting over? It's kind of like Christmas Story before a Nintendo in the 80s. Saw it this weekend. It was pretty fun. Check it out if you are so inclined. But that decade that keeps on giving, that was the 80s. It also gave us Pretty much the dawn of the modern era of professional wrestling. Some might say, like Uncle Mike, the best era that has ever been for professional wrestling. And so, as we are wont to do, let's kick off our broadcast week here with our fun game, Can You Name That 80s Wrestler? The World Wrestling Federation, for over 50 years, the revolutionary force in sports entertainment. Not a theme that immediately jumps to the tip of most people's tongue. I know it certainly did it for me. This guy, definitely more of a, let's say, a B-tier, perhaps even a C-tier player out there in the annals of the legends of the 80s, like your Hulks and your and your Andres and those guys. He wasn't up there. 
He was more a couple of notches below. And not, probably not a theme that jumps to mind to you, but you can reasonably intuit it if you were paying attention. So let's go around the horn now. Uh, he's missed a few, so we'll have to let Uncle Mike, I think, sit for a little bit. As instead, I gave him first crack last week on good old Brutus the Barber and didn't come up with this. So instead, let's have the round robin continue. Let's go back out to the land of Texas. We're big fans of wrestling. He lives down the street from The Undertaker. He is the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. A, how was your Thanksgiving, sir? And B, can you name that, let's say, C-tier 80s wrestler? Uh, yeah, uh, Thanksgiving was great. And one second. Hey, Taker, who was that? Oh, you're right, right, right. That's what I thought. Uh, Coco Beware. Oh, Taker hanging out in the kitchen again. You know, he likes to pop yeah, by. A cup having- of sugar and maybe a casket he wants to borrow. Yeah, he's he's having some some coffee and caskets. That's what we have it every Monday. <laughs> a little C and C in the morning with Taker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was Coco Beware, and you're right. He was C tier. Uh, he was one of those guys you'd see on Saturday morning uh, on the half hour show beating up some jabber, uh, and then he would get in like you know a major wrestling event and lose. So he was a jobber. He would beat the jobbers, and then at the main events, he was a jobber. Yeah, I'm hard-pressed so, to think. He had the bird, obviously, but outside of that, I'm hard-pressed to think of anything else this guy had that was notable. Yeah, he had the bird, uh, and he would go, you know, it, he. Well, let's put it this way. He executed being a bird better than the Red Rooster. Let's just say <laughs> that. Yes, that's high praise indeed, <laughs> which I do believe was voted recently like the worst gimmick of all time, the Red Rooster. Look it up, listener. If you are so inclined, let's go on out now outside of the land of Texas. He's not having C and C's on Monday morning with the undertaker. Cause he's busy watching your portfolios. Listeners. He is uncle Mike to the newest star burning up the YouTubes over there. Mr. Uncle Mike, a welcome back to the program. B did you also know that was Coco beware and C do you have any enduring memories of said wrestler, sir? Yeah, I mean, I think there's some. So, yes, I did know it was Coco Beware. I think he's the only, besides the Red Rooster, who it's just, it's very impressive that Mark Sebastian knows that. It could have been the gobbledygooker. Um, That's also <laughs> bird themes. <laughs> Which, ironically, you know, was was what The Undertaker, that's when he debuted, and he was worried he was going to debut as the gobbledygooker. He thought he was going to be in the egg. They said, nope, you're going to be Undertaker. He's, oh, that's much better. <laughs> that is that, that that is much better. You know, what we should do maybe as as like a, a, an event at some point. The three of us should have like a wrestling, an '80s wrestling trivia contest. I, I imagine with all the popularity of this uh, segment, I bet that would get a lot of attention from our viewers or from our listeners. So, something to think about for the future. But in terms of Coco Beware, um, I, for whatever reason, he couldn't get over, and I thought the crowds liked him. I think if they would have given him a little bit more attention, he could have been more popular. But I was, I, I really liked him. I thought he had a great uh, gimmick, uh, but for whatever reason, uh, just he wasn't. Uh, he, he'd get the crowd super excited. I remember whenever he'd come into the the arena, they'd get really excited. But for whatever reason, I guess uh, he didn't have the wrestling skill to become a superstar because uh, if he did then of course he would have gotten a shot to be the champ but um all the hogans and the andres were just much better skilled wrestlers apparently i don't know if i'd say skilled wrestlers but they definitely were good at, at the gimmick they were more popular uh, yeah skilled yeah, wrestler no one's gonna sit there and say hulk hogan was a good wrestler because he was, he, not- was hey, champ. he had that sweet leg drop Oh yeah well and the, the big boot and he could uh are you insinuating that it's not a real thing he if you're the champ the back. He- Best. You have the ability to scrape the back. <laughs> yes. That. Yes, the back scrape. Yes. The most I mean, devastating Hulk move. Just <laughs> was the worst wrestler, but he was good at uh at being at having a gimmick. And uh, you know, I think everybody had the, their vitamins uh and everybody but everybody else uh quickly realized, hey, this guy's not very good. I mean, can we all WrestleMania six might be the worst wrestling match. It was big, biggest personality to wrestling skill ratio in in the history of uh, the WWF. That wasn't Hogan and Macho, was it? No, it was Ho- Macho was good. I yeah, know. I say Macho was good. Yeah, it was Hogan and Warrior. A Warrior. It was yes. Awful. <laughs> I, love, I love I love me some Hogan. Warrior, but I, I could agree that he definitely had his. Had his faults as we keep on rolling into the trading block. 
It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Trading Block. Hey, we all learned something today. Uncle Mike was the one kid in the 80s who had the Coco Beware wrestling buddy. All the rest of us, I had the Ultimate Warrior. I'm sure Sebastian there had probably had the Hogan. He gripped the shirt off. Uncle Mike, he had the Coco Beware. And maybe we should all beware of these markets. Get that? You like that? I did that, listeners? Coming into showtime today, because, man, we had quite the roller coaster <laughs> over the past few days out here. You know, a half free concession, and obviously that's going to contribute to it as well. Things are a little bit thin on the Friday session. But, of course, we have this new Omicron variant, which just, just sounds intimidating. Sounds like it's from a sci-fi movie, doesn't it, listeners? That probably helps up the fear factor to 11 but of course news of this new omicron variant coming out of south africa which again south africa quite the haven for these things of late just spooking the hell out of everybody sending the markets into a tailspin over the course of friday massive sell-offs on friday and the big question coming into today was will it continue what's going to happen we saw some overseas selling earlier but coming into today the markets were kind of inching their way up and now the inching is done they are firmly in the green. They're like, Omicron, what Omicron? Let's get the heck out of Dodge and let's start rallying again. Uh, coming into the start of the show, the Dow is the laggard up a mere 0.99%. <laughs> S&P up nearly one and two thirds percent. NASDAQ up over 2%, 2.1%. So there's a lot of green on then their screens. Listen, that's what, earlier today. They were kind of just inching. They were tiptoeing their way into the green. And now they're saying, you know what? This is it. We're off to the races. So the vol that had been skyrocketing now coming back in pretty aggressively. We saw a high of VIX of over 28, if you can believe that. And spoiler alert, we didn't have a show, obviously, on Friday, but there were no 28 handles in our prognostication. So if we had done a one-week show, uh, we all would have lost horribly there. So 28.62, I believe, was the high for VIX. When we kicked off the show, it was a little bit shy of the 22 handle. It was a 21 90 looks like it's back up over 22 again 22 and change 22 10 now hanging out at the 22 level but man quite the fall from the 28 handle of not too long ago vbix coming into show time as you might imagine pretty frothy again up about 12 and a half handles up to 127 and a half vxx 21 and three quarters when we kicked off the show that's up a point that one got as high as nearly 25 24 66 out there over the course of the mad panicky sell-off on Friday. Uh, UVXY actually went up again. You know what it takes to do that. <laughs> it's still up. It was up about 1.15. It was at about 16 and three quarters when we kicked off the show. They hit a high of just, just briefly over 20, 20.06. And then it turned right back to the downside. And Vol Q, when we kicked things off, let's see, it was at about a 19. Let's see where it's hanging out right now. Oh, 2060 right now, actually. So that puts it up about oh 1.6 points from where it was on last show by the way last show was of course a week ago listeners there was no show on thursday so there's a lot to unpack here mr meatball if you could tell taker to hold his coffee and caskets for a few minutes we'll start with you as the winner of our coco be weird challenge for today sir first off what were your thoughts as all this was unfolding on Friday. We saw this Omicron race to the downside, and now this still Omicron-driven now race to the upside, sir, for today. Well, my first thought was I was a little disheartened they didn't name it Unicron, and <laughs> uh, I was a little upset. That would have been uh, awesome, I, yes. I would have been behind that. Uh, yeah, I thought that would have been a much better name than, than Omicron. Arson Wells' greatest role, come on. Yes, I, I thought... The, um, you know, it, I thought it got a little overbaked, but you never know, right? You know, we, they come out and I, over the weekend, they say this thing is, is terrible. Everybody jumps on board. We could have been lined up for a really ugly day. But like you said, all things, knowing that liquidity is not there, that we'd seen VIX rising, all, all the things that make us think, yeah, maybe this is a little bit over the top, uh, start coming into focus. And now today we've got a nice little rally. We're up, we've made back about 70% of what we gave away. Um, oil got way, way crushed. Uh, it still has to recover. The Dow uh, today, really a laggard. If you're, if you're sitting here and saying, hey, did I miss the pop? 
Uh, look to the Dow because it was down a thousand. It's only up about 300 points today. So there's still significant upside uh, just to get to where we were on Wednesday if you're looking for some sort of upside play. Uh, but uh, volatility still, we're above 20, where it's trading around 22. Uh, but that being said, uh, UBXY and VXX, here's why they stink, folks. Uh, they are barely off their the, kind of some of the, the lows they were trading at last week, uh, getting absolutely demolished as VIX futures uh, normalize and, and settle in here. <coughs> so, um, you know, that's kind of where we are today. Uh, we still do have some softness floating around out there. And then I guess the other big piece of news we'd be remiss is that um, here's how bad Twitter is. Jack Dorsey didn't even bother to tell to use Twitter to tell the world he was leaving Twitter. <laughs> yes, he chose another. He chose a, the old standard of the press release. Yes, you would have thought he would have tweeted, but no, to no avail. Yeah, Instead, list- he puts out a press release. Our listeners are asking in the live chats, how is it legal for Twitter stock to just halt when it is up 3%, uh, even though Dorsey is stepping down from Twitter? There you go. That was news that was making the rounds out there quite a bit that, yeah, he didn't use his own platform <laughs> to step down from his own platform. It looks like Twitter there holding at about 46 and three quarters. Today it was at 52 almost, uh, giving up the ghost quite a bit out there right now. Mr. Uncle Mike, I know you've started to use Twitter, so perhaps that has come across your radar of late, even though you're growing on YouTube as well. But walk us through the same, the same couple of days for you. You're obviously are permeable here now you come in on friday morning you're full of tryptophan you're full of turkey you're probably still kind of groggy from the madness that is thanksgiving maybe you're scoring some black friday deals i don't know but you see that you come in you hear this omicron news you see the market just in a terrified death spiral and then everyone's on pins and needles all weekend long will we continue to sell off and then it turns around and the market is back and the bulls are firmly in force yet again sir what was your take on this mad, insane a few days, sir? I think just over the course of the few days, um, I typically don't trade a lot during uh, holiday times just because crazy things like that can happen. And so oftentimes you have to get stopped out of something that you normally wouldn't because if there's lower volume, then that gives the lesser amounts of people more control of the markets. And so when we have... Um, Old Omicron. It, it's, to me, it sounds more like a, a Transformers thing from the '80s cartoon. We got Omicron coming to t- as teaming up with the Star Screen. That's what he was saying. He was saying Unicron is from the Transformers movie. Less in case you missed that one. Oh God! He was the big so, planet bad guy. Got it. Got it. Got it. So, but with that, I think that um, with with where we're going with it on days that we're, where we have. Uh, less volume, you just got to be concerned if you have a big move one way or the other. I think it was oh God, it was during the financial crisis one year, or it was in 08 or 09, I think we the Dow moved like 900 points like on a Columbus Day or one of those holidays that wasn't really a full holiday. And so when you have days like that, you really can't buy too much into it or sell too much into it for that matter, just because it's. I don't think it's indicative of what the longer term market and by longer term in this instance i'm referring to the next week uh, is going to bring uh if we would have had a 100 point day in the s&p a week earlier uh then i'd have been a lot more concerned with it but just as it stands uh, my stance uh, i was for my aggressive strategy i was actually in cash all week and still am right now Uh, i'm looking to make a decision on how i'm going to get back into this market later today um just because of the fact that we had such a huge, ridiculous sell-off. And it's one to where when you're looking at if Omicron is going to really be a bad thing, then, of course, the market will continue to go down and uh, travel will be bad and everything will be awful just like it was before. And then everything will be awesome again. Who knows? But um, I just really think that there's times to where hitting the pause button is the the valid thing to do based on an announcement and based on what we had announced on Friday with the Omicron, uh, I think that was the right thing to do. And I was, believe me, on a 100-point down day, as much as I would love to get some deltas on the table, I didn't do it. 
because like what Mark said, you don't know if all of a sudden over the weekend news came out of uh, there's Omicron has been spotted in Illinois, Massachusetts, and Utah or something like that, then we could easily be down another 100 points in the S&P. But with it, uh, for right now, it seems like uh, everything is stable for right now. And even though we're at a higher level, I'd feel more comfortable buying in the market now at the end of the day than I would have on Friday at the end of the day, just because of the fact that we have some stability. Uh, But once again, I'm not putting my money where my mouth is just yet. Yeah, a lot of opportunities for interesting things. Our chat's asking if anybody scooped any VIX puts this week. Mr. Meatball, I'm sure you guys on Friday, you guys like to look at some downside in the vol space. Any intriguing trades or scoops come across your radar as vol was skyrocketing north, sir? Yeah, so it's hard to deny that the you know VIX 17 puts got to 20 cents. I mean, even on the open, things were really cheap. Um, you could scoop up, UVXY 17 puts, 16 and a half puts, uh, both for under a dollar, and they were they were a steal. Uh, I mean, the 18 puts just uh, vol got has is getting smoked at a level that is you know almost as hard as it got rallied on Friday, and it could cascade from here if the market continues to rally. Uh, again, keep an eye on that Dow Jones. That's the soft spot. Keep an eye on oil. Uh, if, if those don't catch a bid, then you have to wonder whether this is a one day pop or whether, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, heading higher. So that is uh, that is where I'm that's where I'm at. But yes, lots of all scoops. Yes, there are lots of scoops on both sides. Notice I got filled on some. Uh... These 20 puts coming up in a couple of weeks there. I didn't realize I got filled on those. So there you go. That's a good, those are looking pretty good right now out there. So I'm with you. Who was it said that? Oh yeah. Nichols, you said you picked up some these 20 puts. I put a few on as well, just for, uh, just for the rainy day fun out there, because you're right. These are all kinds of crazy times. Speaking of which, if you guys have thoughts on where VIX will go, like for example, for that trade, it would be nice if it closed below 20 by the end of the week. Will it happen? Actually, these go out a few, a few weeks, but still. Uh, will it happen? Let us know. That's our question of the week this week. A pretty straightforward one coming back from Turkey Day. Get on over there to at options. Make your voice heard. Very simple question. Does the recent surge in ball have legs or is this a flash in the pan? Quite simply, where will VIX close at the end of this week? And we didn't give you any crazy ranges or anything like that. We just said it's going to be above 20 or below 20. And right now it's a bit of a horse race. <laughs> above 20 losing 46.2, uh, below 20 winning 53.8%. But again, it just went live. Right before showtime, so the voting is young. Get in there at options. Make your voice heard. You can also vote with your dollars, obviously, and trade some VIX options or perhaps spikes if you are so inclined. Those are getting a wee bit tighter out there, a little bit easier to trade these days. Speaking of trading, let's see what's trading out there right now. Let's get on out to VIX land first. VIX, as you might imagine, putting up some numbers today. Pretty much everything's putting up numbers today. It's one of those days, listeners. 470,000 contracts on the tape for VIX. That's not bad considering the ADB had just broken 400K just last week. Now it's back up to 428, so a little bit better. Obviously going to be back up again today. So some volume on the tape in VIX land. Spy, you know this paper out there. Four and a quarter million contracts as of a few minutes ago. The ADB, almost four and three quarters million. So yeah, they're going to hit that today. SPX, similar deal, already north of a million, 1.15 million. As of a few minutes ago, the ADB about one and a half million. So, yeah, they're going to hit that today as well. The Q is already closing in on one and a half million, 1.45 million. The ADV, 1.6 million. So, yeah, spoiler alert, probably going to hit that too. And man, small caps, don't leave them out of the party. 833,000 contracts up in IWM already. The ADV is 905 listeners. That's already super inflated and it's going to hit it. So, we're seeing paper across the board. Let's go on out now to the single names. I know a lot of you. Like to you hang your hats out there these days. Surprisingly, not quite as active as you might expect, given how much action is going up in the broad indexes on a day like today. We've seen well over 300K to break into the top 10 of late. It's still an active day, don't get me wrong. 262 is nothing to sneeze at, but you could easily see 100,000 or close to that more to break into the top 10 on a day like today. And not seeing that today. But it gets us to Ford, number 10. Ford, 262,000 contracts. Is it a meme? Is it not a meme? I know technically by the, if there is a textbook definition of a meme stock, Ford doesn't really meet it. It's not heavily shorted. It actually makes some money. But the price was pretty cheap. 
and it moved a lot. So from that latter, more subjective definition of a meme stock, it certainly qualifies. Either way, it's good for number 10 today, 262,000 contracts. Number nine, one half of the symbol twinology. We love to coin our phrases here. 264,000 contracts for AMC. Number eight, our old friend Credence Clearwater Revival. No, I'm joking, of course. This is Carnival. CCL out there today, 268,000 contracts. Obviously, all these kind of reopening names like the cruise lines got pretty beat up (laughs) over the course of the Omicron madness. Let's see. Carnival was trading last week up to about almost 21, about 2060. And then it took it on the chin on Friday, as you imagine. It sold off from about that level, a little over 20, down to 1738. Looks like a hit on Friday morning before rallying again today up to 1881 and then selling off again now back down to 1772 and then rallying again. So it seems like the recovery in Carnival, perhaps not quite as sure footed as the recovery in the broad market out there. Number eight, 268,000 contracts for Carnival. Number seven, Lucid, you know, it's a day that ends in Y. Something electric vehicle has to be in the top 10. Uh, Today we got Lucid there, 353,000 contracts to number seven. Number six, it's Twitter. You know what's going on there. Twitter, 360,000 for number six. So number seven, 353. Number six, 360. Number five, we've got Pfizer. Again, not a mystery why they're in the top 10 today. 396,000 contracts. So again, we're at number five. We're not even past 400K yet. So that kind of shows you what a weird day it is out there. Number four, AMD. Now we're finally over 400K. AMD, 406,000 contracts, the other half of the symbol twinology number three it's nvidia again everybody needs chips nobody can get them hence nvidia number three four hundred eleven thousand contracts numero due yes it's tesla back from the top spot uh six hundred ninety one thousand contracts and apple taking a bit of a rest still at number one but it's not quite the two and a quarter million whatever it was the last time we were talking about when it was just lighting up the tape out there still Looking pretty good, though, at 984,000 contracts, but nothing over a million today and only cost you 262 to break into the top 10. So perhaps a little bit surprising given how much volume is on the tape today. In terms of earnings, we still have some afoot this week. We've got Salesforce tomorrow. Wednesday, we got Snowflake. Remember them? They were the hot name for like a week, <laughs> but so they seem to have fallen off the radar. Let's see if they're falling off our earnings radar we're coming up on Wednesday. Five below as well. They're going to be like Dollar Store. Dollar Store apparently or Dollar Tree. One of them is now a buck twenty-five tree. <laughs> I know Uncle Mike is going to really put a crimp in your clothing budget. But yeah, interesting stuff. Maybe five below will be 575 below now. We'll find out. Thursday, Dollar General. Yes, they're coming up. And then Kroger and Marvell. And Friday, we got big lots. We got earnings move. Earnings move results. Earnings season. And now the newly minted earnings trades reports. Count them. Four reports for you listeners, all available for free. How much do we like you folks? The options insider.com options, news and articles tab is the place to go to begin your journey. Again, you'd have to go to some research house and commission this and have them do this for you or do it yourself with a spreadsheet, but good luck getting access to the data. That's pretty expensive. So instead we do it for you for free. The options insider.com shoot a note of thanks to the folks over there at Orats while you're at it for making it all possible as we keep on rolling it is time to get weird it is time for the odd block it's time to break down the most interesting unusual and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by the optionsinsider.com it's time for the odd block everybody let's do it let's get weird let's get wild let's get whimsical let us unleash the eye of sauron and see what it finds for us today first let's go out to cbre you've probably seen their signs in the downtown of most major cities they're kind of on the commercial real estate front a lot of office real estate and everything which is again a challenge sector I think to put it mildly (laughs) out there right now ticker symbol of course cbre let's look at their their sordid tail. A year ago, they were trading 61.14. By the way, they're trading 98.91 right now, so a bit of a decent year for them. It's kind of been a long, slow slog to the upside by, let's see, 61 was where they were trading on a year ago. And then by August 5th, they got up to pretty much where they are right now, 98 bucks. And it looks like they kind of been vacillating, so it was faster than I thought. It was only took till August to get back to that level. 
and then it's kind of been vacillating in this 90 odd to maybe a little bit north of 100 there. 52 week high is 107.88. They hit that on November 9th, right around that time frame. And then other than that, they've kind of been pretty much vacillating in this mid 90s range since August. So a nice run from November of last year through August of this year, you know, up a pretty decent clip up from 61 to almost 198 bucks. And then kind of just vacillating, hanging out here, kind of losing some steam ever since there, which is kind of interesting. So let's see what our Eye of Sauron picked up. Actually, this kind of makes sense now, given what we just talked about with that stock chart. Looks like a bit of a roll here, a pretty sizable roll, to be precise here, in CBRE. In particular, we saw first a 20,000 lot of the Dece 90 calls going up for $9.73. They kind of split the uprights. The stock was, or excuse me, the options were nine fifty at ten ten when these went up. These could certainly qualify as Mifi. They are both beefy and meaty. That was about a, almost a 38 ball, about a 37.90 on the ball front. The stock was 99.18 when this went up. And then we also saw another 20,000 lot going up at the same time, hence a spread, which made us think roll, of the March 95. So it looks like they're rolling up and out also for 20,000, going up, let's say, 20,000 times for 9.05. These were closer to the bid. The market was 8.90. At 940 when these went up for 905, so 15 cents off the bid there. And so that was strange because they both were kind of leaning towards the bid. And it's obviously it's sometimes it's hard with options this wide to kind of get a sense for the execution. And also, there's probably going to be a stock leg with that. And that's probably why these executions are a little bit funky because they can play with the stock leg as well in terms of how they put this roll up. You know, there's got to be more to this story. So we said the eye of Sauron go back looking for more, and it did. And it found us that these Dece 90s were actually opened back on September 1st. So it's been nearly nearly three months now for this trade. So they did them a while ago. They put on 20,000 of them back then for $10.10. Now, that time they were kind of almost lifting the offer against these. So it looked like they might have been buying these. But again, they were done as a spread. It looks like tied to stock. So the stock was 97.06 when they did this. So if they're buying options for 1010. And then closing them out today for 973, then they lost money on that trade. I think it's fair to say. And if they sold stock against it, which it looks like they did at 9706, the stock when they did this trade today was 9918. So they lost about two bucks on the stock. And then they lost, oh, looks like about 40 odd cents on these options alone. And they put obviously put more money to work back on the March side. So weird one all around, but looks like they're keeping the party alive. Mr. Meatball, what is your spidey sense telling you out there? You think they bought these and then are rolling these? You think they are buying the March leg as a result? Think they did it with stock or not? What do you think went on with this funky roll here in CBRE, sir? Yeah, you know, um, it definitely looks like it was done with stock. And I think I think that they're buyers. That's my guess. They're just giving themselves some extra time and and trading through it that's my best guess do you like them tied to stock or untied sir i mean it's a weird one right it is a weird um, one yes <laughs> hence the odd block yeah i mean if the if the stock's gonna take off then then sure i i, I mean i i guess it's all right delta neutral but um it didn't need a ton of stock i didn't think there was a huge change in delta there so uh, you know, definitely, definitely interesting that that this trade. It's I'll be I, I'm going to be very curious to see what you know open interest looks like. I mean, they're definitely closing the December and definitely opening the Dece. Um, you know, could be some sort of overwrite trade where they're just looking to collect premium and don't think CBRE is going to going to do it. This one is really hard to read. Um, I'd have to reach out to the broker and uh, to one of my brokers to see what the actual story is. Yeah, this, these are the fun ones to uh, with multiple moving parts listeners that the brokers can play with to play with the execution a little bit to game the system a little bit out there. So if there's a stock leg, which it seems like there is, there are three moving parts to this trade that all can be played with to make the execution that much more fun and intuitive. But it seems like at first blush, it seems like they bought these these 90s against stock and then are now rolling them because they. If you're going to do these delta neutral listeners, you need you need buying vol at that point. You need a big move, <laughs> and uh, it's interesting to see they got a little bit of a move enough to maybe keep them afloat. But we shall see. It looks like they're keeping that party alive through March. We're going to keep an eye on these. 
and come back to these bad boys as well, man. Our, our cup overfloweth with trades to watch here. Let's go on out now to Confluent, Inc. It's been a while since we talked about them out there. Ticker symbol CFLT. Trading right now $84 and about a half. A year ago, it was trading 45 bucks. They've had a nice run. And they kind of hung out in that $40 range all the way through August of last year. And then pretty much started rallying. By September, they're trading 72. And then they kind of gave it up again down to the mid-60s. And they rallied hard in October from 63 and about a half all the way up to 93.60. So a nice run for them in early November. Then they kind of gave it back up by... Just uh, last week, they were trading 79 bucks again. So they had a brief show of life, and they kind of gave it up, and now they're kind of rallying again to where they we find them today, about 84.40. Still a good year, up about 87.5%. Nothing to sneer at out there, but an interesting couple of months out here as well. What do we find out here in Confluent? Ah, a little bit more straightforward paper, it seems like. Still sizable, though. We got the D's 65 puts. So again, nearly 20 handles out of the money. Going up for 66 cents. That's a fair amount of juice for these bad boys. That's an 83 vol, if you're wondering. Looks like paper sold them 12,556 times. Uh, let's see. The stock was right about 82 bucks. The stock was lower when he got that. Explains some of this juice they got for it. But still, you're talking about 20% plus out of the money options. There are no earnings between now and December. Next earnings are on February 24th. So they sold nearly a 20 handle out of the money option. The stock, I mean, the stock was there a year ago. In fact, the stock was trading 63 around early October. So it's not inconceivable that it could get there again by December. But still, it's a fair amount of juice for an option that is 20 handles out of the money with a month to go or less now, listeners. Interesting stuff. Mr. Meatball, what say you? An 83 vol, 12,556 of these D65 line in the sand puts. Love them or hate them, sir? You know, I do like high vol, and I do love a line in the sand on these. Um I don't I don't hate this. This makes some sense. This makes sense unlike that CBRE trade. Well they say if it makes dollars, it makes sense, right? And this has a good chance of perhaps making some dollars here. Sixty six cents they got for these. How would you do these? Listen, would you like these? Would you sell these? Would you perhaps keep your powder dry? Would you buy them? Probably not the latter, but maybe would you sell these? <laughs> Intriguing stuff. They were sixty five at ninety five when these things went up. So they didn't play around. They hit the bid. They said that bid's pretty pretty juicy. We'll take it. Wow. That's that's a lot of juice for Confluent, but again, chart has been moving, so intriguing stuff as we keep on rolling to our final name. We're going back to corporate real estate listeners, because why not? <laughs> We're going to corporate office properties trust. Yeah, this is let's get another one of these uh one of these REITs. <laughs> so many REITs we talk about here on the show these days. Ticker symbol OFC trading right now, right about 26 bucks, up about a three cents today. On the year, it's been a more Interesting. So actually, look at this. Interesting. A year ago, I was trading almost exactly where it is right now. It was trading 2606. So it was about 50 odd cents different from where it is right now. So net on the year, you could say it's been a whole heck of a lot of nothing. But actually, there's been a lot of fits and troughs along the way. It got down to 2480 on January 7th when all the meme madness kicked off and everything down there in D.C. was kicking off. Then it rallied almost instantly up to about 27 and a half on February 4th and back down to 25 on March 2nd. And back up to 28.20 on March 15th. And it did that multiple times. And had a nice run there in May from 26.73 to 30 bucks, the high of the year, 30 and a half on pretty much June 8th, right around our favorite day again. June 8th and 9th and 10th is when it kind of hit that lofty highs north of 30 bucks. Had a nice run then. And then it kind of sold off almost immediately again, back down to 27 bucks on <laughs> June 29th. And then back up again to about almost 30 bucks on July 20th. This thing has been. Very topsy turvy for a net nothing year. It's uh, it, it has had some movement and then it sold off hard again in September from twenty eight bucks down to twenty six. Again, this is all relative. The stock hasn't had the most enormous of ranges, but within that range, it has had a lot of movement. And then over the course of the last month, it's been selling off again. It was twenty eight and a half back on November fifth, and then it's had a just a drubbing. And Friday took it down again from twenty seven and a quarter down to twenty six bucks, where it kind of hangs out right now. So this one has had a turbulent year and a turbulent second half of the year as well which pretty much erased any gains it had on the year now so in fact actually it's off now it's off two percent on the year so it's losing money on the year so an interesting year for everyone's favorite name a newcomer to the odd block this is corporate office properties trust ticker symbol ofc what did our eye of sauron find out here it looks like it found 
some puts again. Let's have going back to the line in the sand in commercial real estate. It's the Jan 25 puts, so a buck out of the money pretty much, going up for 71 cents, 7,280 times. This is a decent amount of juice, listeners, but not a huge vol. We were talking about an 83 vol for CFLT. We're talking a 27 and a half vol for OFC, so a little bit of a different beast, but still, from a net juice perspective, very similar. Uh, their stock was actually a little bit lower when these went up. Stock was 25 and three quarters. There are no earnings. Their next earnings are on February 3rd. So Mr. Meatball, we got a similar line in the sand here. A little bit quieter name than our last name. A lot lower vol, but it's still a pretty hefty premium level for these Jan 25 puts in corporate office properties trusts, sir. What say you? Yeah, you know, 27 and a half vol for a REIT is really high. Um, and they got a pretty good, pretty darn good price given how wide that market was. Um, I get why I went to the floor. Uh, really, no, uh, no earnings. That's pretty darn good juice. Getting almost three percent between now and January. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't hate this at all. Uh oh, might have some, might have some trades for the Gamdar coming up here in Uh-oh. everyone's favorite corporate office properties trust. Yeah, I don't hate these either. I don't hate either of these puts, but I definitely don't hate the latter ones as well. So yeah, interesting. What do you, th- what do you think of these two? Line the sand puts listeners. Which do you prefer? Hit us up. Let us know as we keep on rolling. It's that time, listeners. We all needed him last week because it was just crazy time. We needed him to talk us off the ledge. He's back here today. It is time for Uncle Mike and the Strategy Block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the Strategy Block. All right, listeners, again, we all missed him on Friday. We need him to talk him off the ledge in times of turbulence. So Uncle Mike, sir, you're a resident permable, a ray of sunshine here on a deeply cynical show. What's been lighting up your tape and what, what do you got in store for us today in these crazy times, sir? Ratio spreads, margin, and capital gains all in one. Are you excited? Whoa, I'm, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. I'm getting excited, sir. So let's say that you're looking to sell some stock. You own some stock and you're thinking you want to sell it. And just because either the market's high and you're just concerned about long-term capital gains. So you're like, well, I really don't want to pay the tax on this, but I definitely want to, I'm kind of concerned about the market being higher. Well, a choice of what you can do, and I'm not saying this is the right thing to do, but something with which to consider is that if you have a large enough portfolio, you could perhaps take out a loan on margin. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's say that you own uh, $500,000 worth of stock, and we'll just make it simple. You own $500,000 worth of SPY, and you need cash for whatever reason, and you take out a loan. Let's say you want to take out a $10,000 loan, or you need $10,000, but you know that if you sell the stock, you'll have to pay taxes on that. You'll have to pay a little bit more, whatever the case may be, or even $100,000, $10,000, whatever number you want to use. And so when doing this, one thing you can do is if you use margin, all you're doing is taking out a loan. Now, the advantage of margin is the fact that you'll get to keep that stock working for you, assuming the stock is going up or SPY is going up. Of course, the disadvantage is that it could work against you and it's not your money and it could uh, earn you on it. But let's say you have a longer term approach to this and you have the means with which to pay the interest on the margin. Now, when doing this, I would recommend holding your stock at a broker that has a very low margin interest rate. Uh, you can find them out there for between 1% and 2% annually, and you can find them for, quite frankly, less than that uh, if you really look hard enough. And so the question becomes, do I want to pay this 1% interest rate on a loan, or do I want to pay a 15% capital gains tax? And the answer to that is a very definite and very definitive, maybe. (laughs) And so the way with which you can do this is if you really want to get around the tax. Let's say that you take out the loan and you pay, and I'm just going to use oversimplified numbers, you pay 1% a year for 15 years on this loan. Well, at that point in time, it's the same as what you would have gotten on the capital gains tax, let's say. Uh, And this is assuming no time time value of money or nothing along those lines. But let's say you're paying this interest on the loan. At that same time, the stock is still working in your favor. 
So the concept would be is if the stock can increase while you're taking out the loan, the increase of the stock could potentially offset the cost of the capital gain. And then if the stock increases enough over a 10 to 15 year period, then you've made a better decision than simply uh, taking paying the capital gains tax because then you can sell the stock and then uh, that makes up for the cost of the capital gain, whatever the case may be. Now, of course, I'm being very vague and very general in saying this because this is not a simple solution. Now, let's say that you're concerned that a stock's not going to quite appreciate as much as you had before. Well, there's a strategy called a one by two ratio spread to where if you know that if the stock increases to a certain level, you know that you would sell it at that level because it would give you the amount of return that you would need. If you want to create extra leverage on the stock, you could, and I've talked about this strategy on the strategy block before, you could sell two calls, buy one call, and create a little bit more leverage on the stock itself. Now, of course, there'd be tax on the gain from the ratio spread, uh, as well as the tax on the stock. But my point is, is that throughout all this, if you're really concerned with selling a stock and you really want to avoid the capital gains, there are creative ways around it. Now, of course, the other thing you can do is you can put a collar on it to protect the downside. If you're more concerned about the downside, uh, you have that ability as well. Bottom line is this. You don't necessarily have to pay capital gains tax if you are concerned about the stock being too high or if you need cash. There's ways around it by using margin and options. But you need to have a very in-depth understanding how both of these things work. Margin interest rates are not fixed, folks. They could go up. And you might not get the fill on the ratio spread uh, that you wanted as well. Also, put premium, if you're going the collar out, might be expensive as well. There are choices, and I would recommend that you explore all of them before making a decision. There we go. Listeners, explore your options as we keep on rolling into real quick mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the mail block. Weird week last week. Obviously, didn't have a chance to do a mail block on Thursday, so we'll We'll start off by paying off our question of the week from last week. We asked you, in honor of the shortened holiday week, we thought we'd ask you, which market development or trend are you most thankful for this year? And you can always reply DM with your alternatives. Give you four choices. Options, volume explosion, the meme stock madness, the crypto rampage, or the bull market breakout. You see, some of our producers like alliteration <laughs> over there. And it was a weird poll back and forth that ended up with some weird ties. Uh, the options volume explosion and crypto rampage both went both tying, I should say, with about 33 percent. And then meme stock madness and bull market breakout also tying with around 17 percent. So weird poll, <laughs> but uh, the volume explosion tying with crypto, which is intriguing out there. This week's question, like we mentioned, which is going hot and heavy right now. We're asking you quite simply, does this surge in vol have legs? Will VIX close above or below 20 by Friday? And it has surged and rallied. You said before, below 20 was winning. Now it's literally tied, 50% each. No bias in any direction out there. So interesting stuff. What do you guys think? Let your voices be heard. Speaking of letting your voices be heard, Mr. Uncle Mike, we had a question for you. This came from Luigi. I believe this came on our live chat last week. We didn't have a chance to get to it, so let's get to it now. He says, I have a question for Uncle Mike. I watch a few weekend market shows, and Barron's Roundtable did a segment on how to use options. He says, does this fall into the category of your hairdresser talking about a stock? So I guess he's asking you, if Barron's Roundtable is talking about options, is, is that the moment? Is that the straw that breaks the back? Is that the canary in the coal mine, sir, that we need to get the heck out of Dodge? I wouldn't think so, just because um, they probably talked, talked about like protective puts as well as upside calls. So I don't know if I would necessarily say that's a canary in the coal mine, per se. Uh, valid point, though. Uh, it could be the case. Uh, but no, I think that they're, uh, although they may or may not have done a good job on it, I wasn't able to see the segment. But because of the fact that if, and I do emphasize if, they made the segment along the lines, you can be bullish, bearish, or protective, 
then I think it would be okay. If it was something along the lines of uh, uh, this is how you can leverage yourself, then I would say it's a canary in the coal mine. Yeah, Baron's a little bit more skin in the financial game than, let's say, your hairdresser or your cabbie or your Uber driver to modernize that metaphor out there. So not quite the same thing, Luigi, but I get where you're coming from here. As we keep on rolling, it is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. It's fun to watch this poll. With every tick and VIX, we get new movements. Now, below 20 is just barely winning. 53% versus 47% for above 20. Get out there. Make your voice heard, listeners. It's hot and heavy, fast and furious out there on the old poll. You know where to find it. Twitter.com slash options is the place to go to play along with all the fun stuff we do throughout the week. Uh, Let's go around the horn. Let's go back out to the greasiest of meatballs. Mr. Meatball, sir, if you can... Push aside the taker just for a second, sir. We'll get back to him in a minute. Uh, what's on your radar for the rest of this week until we can gather here together on Thursday, sir? Uh, well, I'm, of course, I'm very interested in what uh, the Unicron variant is going to do. Uh, will it swallow the planet or will we defeat it with the matrix of antivirals and vaccines? Um, and uh, uh, then... You know, you have to watch what's going to happen with the Fed and bonds. Does this slow them down? Uh, Bonds, again, you know, we don't usually talk too much about it, but they made an incredible move on Friday. Take a look at TLT, folks, and then take a look at HYG. If if you want to worry about something, watch that spread. If HYG is dropping as TLT is going up, that is a real problem. Um, and that is the type of stuff that can actually spur a real sell-off. Now, we saw a, a weak sell-off in HYG on Friday with a boom out of TLT today. TLT off the touch, but still really strong. So keep an eye on bonds because as bonds go, the market goes. I'm watching the VIX. Uh, is it going to go below 20 by the end of the week? If I was a betting man, I would say yes, uh, but... Uh, obviously, we'll know more uh, by tomorrow. I want to see if we have a uh, whether this is a one day kick. So I really just need to see what happens tomorrow. Well, you're making our chat happy. A lot of VIX 20 put holders sounds like in the chat, sir. So from your lips to the ears of the market, sir, <laughs> VIX below 20. That would certainly make our poll interesting towards the latter portion of the week. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, if you have a thoughts on our poll, have at it. And B, more importantly, what are you keeping an eye on until we gather here together on Thursday? I'm actually keeping a really close eye on how we close today. I think it's going to be a thing where um, if we can uh, gain back at the end of the day all of what we lost on Friday, I think that would be a pretty bullish signal, but uh, you never know. Uh, So I'm definitely watching that. And like Mark, I'm also watching the 10-year. We had the big rally on it on Friday, uh, but once again – the only thing I would add to that is that uh, we were we're probably about where we were a week and a half ago in the ten year, and so it, it's gonna if, if we're gonna have more fear on it, we're gonna have to gain more ground before uh, I become a ten year fear man. But um, it's definitely a very fascinating thing to watch right now because if we do get continued buyers in the ten year, then um, we could be in for some troubled times in the S&P, but we'll see. So I'm watching the 10-year and the S&P fairly closely right now. All right, listeners, that's going to do it for the old OB this week, but never fear. It's a regular market week this week, so we're back at you with all of our shows, including extras coming at you later today, of course, with the crypto rundown in about an hour. So stay tuned for that tomorrow. Coming at you with a double dose got a great pro q a you asked for him back so he brought him back for you to pick his brains on all things futures and futures options and commodities hot areas these days as you might imagine mr dan gramza uh, the educator extraordinaire over there for cme and of course capital management all the other things he does the man could talk commodities for hours so get your questions in all these crazy markets are moving all over the place nat gas crude crypto ags metals you name it they're moving all over the place Now's the time to pick his brain. He's the man to talk about. It's coming up.
tomorrow. Of course, check your email for the exact times you'll get that newsletter in there. You should have gotten it already. With the times, you can set your calendar if you want to join us live. Of course, after the fact for all you pro members in your exclusive podcast feed. And then, of course, double dose tomorrow. You're also getting the advisor's option. So I'll be back with the Oracle of New Hampshire to talk all things Vol and everything else and what the advisors are out there doing to uh, to make this spot even easier for you folks out there from a options trading and Vol perspective. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Let's go back to the greasiest of meatballs, a.k.a. the winner of our Coco Beware Challenge today. Mr. Meatball, if folks are intrigued, they want to check out your Gamdar or anything else you guys got cooking, maybe a Cyber Monday deal, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, go to optionpit.com and make sure you're uh, signed up for our email list. Uh, We put out amazing content every day. Uh, We are doing a Cyber Monday special, but uh, you need to come to optionpit.com to check that out. Uh, or if you want, you can email me, marketoptionfit.com, and I'll get you in touch with our people. There you go. Get in touch with his people over there in the land of the pit. Uncle Mike is just one person, but he's blowing up all the different platforms, the Twitters, the YouTubes, and so on and so forth. Mr. Uncle Mike, if folks want to check you out on your myriad of outlets now, where should they go? What should they do? Well, first off, I am not just one person. I have a team of experts behind me uh, through RCM Wealth Advisors. Uh, one of those, George, actually uh, was the invest was the trade had the I'm sorry Trader of the Year award given to him. You can find more out, out about that on our website. Uh, but with that, uh, he actually had his strategy picked up by a mutual fund that was so successful. But anyway, with that, if you would like to work more with a financial advisor who believes in the option product, if it's deemed appropriate, feel free to check out my website, stcharleswealth.com, or follow me on Twitter at Mike Tusaw, T-O-S-A-W, or you can check out my latest YouTube video, What is a Call Option? I will have plenty more of those coming in the new year, working on a lot of them, and uh, very excited for what's going to be happening in 2022. Let Uncle Mike learn you some options. The place to start, of course, St. Charles Wealth. Com. Uncle Mike and his team, his legion of experts over there, will help you out at stcharleswealth.com. we got to get on out of here. We'll, set. we'll be back in a little bit less than an hour now for the crypto run now. Stay tuned for that. Then tomorrow, double dose of content, the advisor's option coming at you hot and heavy, followed by your Q&A with the one and only Mr. Dan Graham. So back on Wednesday for your double dose of education, OPR, options boot camp. Then back again on Thursday for episode two of the option block. We'll see you then. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>